any man can be God. So why should I believe Jesus, the son of a carpenter, is actually God? John has a difficult task to prove that. And we're only in chapter 1. And he's saying, you remember John the Baptist? He was a very popular uh, man baptizing people in the Jordan River. Many people believed what he was saying. And he was saying that Jesus existed before time, before I existed. And he is God. He is the chosen one. The baptism of Jesus was an event to remember. John tells people what he experienced on the day that he baptized Jesus. People have been praying for the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one. Do you know the Christmas song, O Come Thou Long Expected Jesus? Now, uh, it expresses the burden of their prayers. They were looking forward to the Savior. Why am I saying that? I want to emphasize these people are looking for the Savior. And John is announcing, here comes the Lamb of God. Why is that important? Because a lot of people say, oh, all the Jews were looking for the king. That's why they didn't see the Lamb. John is addressing the other people because Pharisees were looking for the king and the Pharisees were saying he can't be the Messiah because he's not the king. Remember what I said last week? The book of Matthew is written to prove that Jesus is the king. John is trying to prove that Jesus is God. So they have two different purposes for writing these gospels. So don't try to compare them. You have a different audience. So, while the Pharisees were trying to push everybody in one direction, saying, if he's not the king, he's not the Messiah, there were others who were looking for the Messiah, the Lamb of God. After all, what do they do at the temple? That lamb that they're sacrificing does not represent the conquering king. The lamb dies for our sin. That was taught all the way back when Adam sinned and he had to sacrifice a lamb for his sin. And then God used the, the skin to make clothes and replace fig leaves. Okay? So... Just in case you come across somebody who thinks they only looked for a king, realize John is speaking to a different group of people. Thirty-five and thirty-six says the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, "Look, the Lamb of God." I have to tell you one of my experiences. When I when I went to Bible college, uh, I remember a new translation came out for the Inuit people. The Inuit, we call them Eskimos, but that's a negative term. In Canada, you don't say the word Inuit. You, I mean, you don't say the word Eskimo, you say Inuit. They live in the Arctic Circle where trees do not grow. How many times do you see the word tree in the Bible? How do you translate that for them? They think a tree is anything that stands upright. So if they pile a bunch of rocks on top of each other, usually that's a marker for directions, like follow this path. You'll see another one further down. But they also call it a tree because it stands upright. If they ever get below the Arctic Circle, they might see a real tree. Well, are there any lambs in the Arctic Circle? Think about this. They had no written word of God. 
So if you were the translator, how would you translate lamb? They have reindeer. The reindeer is called a caribou. The translator who translated their, their Bible, their New Testament, instead of lamb, he said uh, this whole sentence, that which looks like that which looks like a caribou calf. Well, a caribou calf kind of looks like a lamb, right? Now translate this verse. Behold, that which looks like a caribou calf takes away the sin of the world. Wow. I think I lost something in the translation. Translating is not easy. <laughs> I'm amazed when I hear you guys translate. <laughs> so anyway, so ever since I, I heard about the new translation for the Inuit, I, I always think of this verse. Well, that's getting off the subject. Anyway, now it says, the next day John was there again with two disciples. Two of his disciples. Now, I don't know if these two disciples witnessed Jesus' baptism. But John is announcing that Jesus is the Lamb. So, keep that in mind that there are two people out there with John. Because we're going to come back to that. Uh, I mentioned to some of the people earlier that as we read this section, you should be asking a lot of questions. This is probably the best section to ask questions, okay? And after I start asking these questions, you'll probably say, why didn't I think of that question? I want you to start to learn how to ask questions as you read. That's probably the most important rule that you're going to learn today. Ask questions. Verse 35 says, the next day. Does that mean the day after Jesus' baptism? What do you think? Okay. That's my question. You should have asked, what is the next day? What happened after Jesus got baptized? If you read Matthew or Mark, I mean Matthew or Luke, you would know that after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. How long was he in the wilderness? 40 days and 40 nights, right? Okay. So, is this af the next day after his baptism? Okay. See, that's one of the questions we should ask. What is the next day? Because if you're thinking of cross-referencing, another rule in inductive reading, use a cross-reference. Wait a minute. Matthew and Luke say he went out to be tempted. And that was a long time. What is the next day? Well, it refers to the next day that Jesus was seen by John. How do I know this? Well, after he was tempted, he went in the wilderness for 40 days. The chronological order of these events is not important to John. Where Matthew and Luke, even Mark, they're writing in chronological order. So you know what came first, second, and third. But John is trying to point out certain things to show you he is God. And remember this? And remember this? Well, now I'm jumping all over time. The timeline is not straight. Okay? So that's another rule in inductive reading. Remember the writing style. Okay? John 1, 37 through 38 says, When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. 
Turning around, Jesus saw them. He saw them following, and he asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means te teacher, where are you staying? Okay. Here's another thing I want you to do when you're reading. Imagine yourself being there. You, today, are one of those two disciples. You're standing there with John, and John points out, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. You are looking at God. You are standing so close to God. How do you feel? Wow. Okay. So, what's that? Well, these are all followers of John. Okay. So, he, they're going to believe John's uh, witness. He's saying, Jesus... The, the, the Son of God is walking on this earth right now. Prepare your lives. Get right with God. Start walking with God because you might be running right into him. And what do you know? Here he is. Yeah, I, I get nervous. Okay, so you're one of the two. And he's saying he's right there. Okay, you know, I would really want to talk with God but I am so, so unworthy. I don't have the right to talk to him. So, you know what I might do? I might try to memorize his face. I don't want to forget what God looks like. I might want to re remember everything about him, his size, his height, you know. I want to take in as much of him as I can. But while I'm gathering all this information about God, which is all external, I don't realize, but I'm actually following him. Uh-oh. He turns around, looks me straight in the eye, and he says, what do you want? Uh. And so, first thing that comes to my mind is, where do you live? Think of that, this now. If two totally strange, totally foreign people, two people you've never met, asked you, where, you live, where do you live? Do you want to tell these strangers who smell like fish where you live? And after I say that, I'm going to think, oh, I didn't want to ask that question. In fact, he asked me a question. I'm supposed to answer his question, not ask him another question. I wish I could just take that back. But you know what he does? He says, come and see. Ah. God is saying, I can come and see where he lives? Wow. My jaw would drop. I would, I would be stuttering. Don't you get more out of this by trying to identify with the people that are in this story? Okay, that's one of the things that I want you to do today. Now, come and see. Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Some translations will say it was the 10th hour. If you get a translation that tells you what hour of the day it was, I want you to think about the workday starts at sunrise. Approximately 6 in the morning is the first hour. So you count 10 hours later, it's 4 in the afternoon. It's an approximate time depending on the year, uh, the time of the year. Okay? So it's around 4 o'clock the tenth hour. Now, I want you to notice John's writing style again. He gives a general picture before he gives the details. The general picture is that they stayed with Jesus. Because he said, come, right? Come and see where I live. But, before they went to stay with Jesus, 
A lot of things happen. And John tells you that later. So first you get the big picture, come and see. Okay. But wait, Andrew has to go get his brother. Okay, so we're going to see some details. A lot of scriptures are written like that where you'll get the, the big picture before they go into the details. Be aware of that. Verses 40 through 42. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and, he who, and, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, me, which when translated is Peter. Remember I said, ask a lot of questions, okay? This section should cause you to ask questions. Now, did Jesus change Peter's name when he first met Peter? Is John writing in chronological order? Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. You are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Do you remember that? That's when Peter's name was changed. That is, that is found in Matthew chapter 16. Now, Matthew is writing in chronological order. We are in the first chapter of John. Peter's name is not changed until chapter 16 in Matthew. So. No. Figure of The Mount of Transfiguration was long after they first met. He already had 12 disciples following him at that time. So, if we know that John is not writing in chronological order, then we could say, oh, remember I said, ask a lot of questions? When did Jesus change Peter's name? A lot later. Okay. What's another question? Why is John bringing it up? What does that have to do with Peter's name? <laughs> what? Can you? I'm sorry. I, I, I. No. Oh. He, okay. I want you to think. Peter is not having an experience here. In fact, he just arrived. Okay? So we see no discourse between Peter and Jesus. Think of who John is writing to. John is, when did this book get written? In the 80s. 8-0. The 10th, uh, the 8th decade. Okay? So, Jesus has, had been crucified over 50 years ago. I am reading this for the first time. I'm not a follower of Jesus. I've heard about Peter, right? But it says here, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, okay. Andrew first finding his brother Simon, okay? Who's Simon? I don't follow these people. I'm not a Christian. Who is Simon? I know I've heard of Peter, but I haven't heard of Simon. And John is saying, this is the guy Jesus changed the name to Peter. 
Okay. Oh, so Andrew's related to Peter. Yeah, now we got the connection. So every now and then you have to think about the audience that's reading this book. Okay. So. Did I finish this uh, through 42? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell them, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Now, where did Cephas come along? How many of you knew that Peter was also called Cephas? We're getting kind of confusing with all these names, and it's all the same guy. Okay. So. Peter means rock. Okay. The spoken language in Israel is Aramaic. It is not Hebrew. Cephas in Aramaic means rock. If I'm writing to people in Israel, I'm not going to say Peter. I'm going to say Cephas. Because they remember him as Rocky. Okay? Da, 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 da. Anyway. <laughs> so, this is Cephas, to them. Now, Simon is English. If his name were used in Hebrew, it would be uh, Simeon. You've heard of Simeon, one of the 12 sons of Jacob? Well, that's who he was named after. Simeon, and then later on, add that to Peter, they would be calling him Simeon Cephas. We call him Simon Peter, but they're Jewish. So, I told you before, when we started this, this is the section of the chapter that will cause you to ask a lot of questions. And after I ask these questions, you're going to say, why didn't I think of that question? I've read this many times before, and it never dawned on me that that was a problem. Verses 43 through 45. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Another rule in inductive reading is understand culture and geography. The Jews were required to make a, let me see, the Jews were required to make a pilgrimage to Israel, uh, to the temple, three times a year. Can you name one of those times? What celebration did they go down there for? Passover. Very good. Can you name another one? Pentecost. And the last one is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is in the autumn. Passover and Pentecost are in the spring. Now, after they celebrate the Passover, Yom Kippur, or Pentecost, then everybody returns home. Home could be in another country. Now, if they're coming from another country, the whole family usually doesn't come down but one male representative from the family will come down and worship at the temple on behalf of the family. I want you to imagine a caravan going home 
They usually cross the Jordan River. They leave Jerusalem, they cross the Jordan River, and they go up the Transjordan Highway on the east side of the Jordan River. If you turn your pages over, you'll see a map. You'll see the Jordan River. Imagine a highway on the east side of the Jordan River. And then after they go further north, then they split up, and some go to Syria, some go to Turkey. Uh, they pass through Lebanon. Okay. What a caravan that's moving up north. A lot of people. It's like all these cars trying to get to the uh, the county fair. There's a lot of cars going that way. So this is getting into the culture. We can identify it with some of the things that we have going on where everybody wants to go and then after it's over, they're all leaving together. Now, Galilee, these guys are from the Galilee region. That's approximately 80 or 90 miles from Jerusalem. Wow. God has asked me to walk with him. How would you like that? Any of you like hiking? <laughs> I used to love to hike. Look at nature. Past things, you know. It's beautiful to walk. And it's always fun to walk with a friend. You like to walk down the mall with a friend or you like to go by yourself? You know? You want to be with friends, right? But with God. God is inviting me to walk with him, and this is going to be a hike. It might take a couple days, depending on how close we are when we met him, but it might take a whole week. This is cool. I used to love hiking, and then I joined the army. <laughs> so anyway, I just want you to get the feel of this. I love this chapter because I can identify with a lot of it. So... Anyway, verse 35 tells us that Andrew was with a friend when John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who was that friend? Who? No, Philip wasn't there. Because the next day Jesus told Philip, Hey, you want to join us? And then Philip went to get his friend, Nathaniel. So right now, I can name four people. Andrew got Simon. Philip got Nathaniel. There are five of them, because Andrew was with somebody when John said, Behold the Lamb of God. Who was the fifth guy? What? John the Baptist? No, John the Baptist is not going to walk with them. He's too busy getting people wet. What? No, that Simon. Andrew got Simon. Okay. Unless he's got a second personality. You know. <laughs> Some of the questions you ask will really make you think. Who knows all the details of this event? John. Which John? <laughs> what? Yes! The person who wrote this gospel, the Apostle John. He knows all the details. And remember what I said last week? John will never tell you his name. And if he if he refers to himself, oftentimes he'll say, oh, the, the, the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't like to use his name. And he's not bragging. He's not saying, Jesus loved me more than you. <laughs> no. John is saying, I am so unworthy of his love, and he loved me anyway. 
and he, he had a nickname for me and my brother James. What was that? Sons of Thunder, because they were so hot-headed and they talked like sailors. That's not good. So I used to be a sailor too. Anyway, but <laughs> that, that has nothing to do with the way I talk. But anyway. Oh, so Jesus used to call them that, right? Yeah, he used to call them Bonargis, Sons of Thunder. Okay, so John can't say Jesus loved me more than the others because Jesus had a bad nickname for me. See, so John, when he says the apostle whom Jesus, I, I'm bringing this up because a lot of people assume that John was the most loved apostle. He was not the most loved, loved apostle. But he was humbly trying to say, I don't deserve his love. Okay? What's that? Yes. In spite of his hot head, a short temper, and uh, probably foul language. Very salty. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Very good. You figured it out who the fifth person was. <laughs> now, we're going to get into more difficult questions here. Verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. I want you to think about this now. Nathaniel thought that Philip had been deceived. There's a con artist trying to tell my friend Philip that he's God. Okay? The town of Nazareth is not mentioned anywhere in the scriptures, not even in the apocryphal books. Everybody knows what the apocryphal books are? No. Okay. In, in the Catholic Church, they have additional books. In the Orthodox Christian church, they have additional book. They have even more than the Catholic church, okay? I think Catholic has seven extra books in the Old Testament. Orthodox have nine extra books in the Old Testament. The Jews read these books. They will say, we are reading from 1 Maccabees, chapter such and such and verse such and such. And then, this, then later on in the service, they will say, now we will read from the Holy Scriptures. There is a difference. The, the apocryphal books are not inspired by God to the Jew. They are inspired to the Catholic Church, but they are not inspired to the Jews. But they are worth reading. They have good spiritual lessons. They have very good history, Jewish history. And they remember the Jewish history because it's written in such as First and Second Maccabees. Without those two books, we would know nothing about Hanukkah. Okay? That's an exciting section of history. Really exciting. But anyway, so even, even in the New Testament, they quote from the apocryphal books. Okay? So, Nathaniel knows Nazareth is not mentioned in any of the scriptures nor in the apocryphal books. How could anything come out of Nazareth? All right? There's more reason why Nathaniel thinks that somebody conned his good friend Philip. The Pharisees, who are the scholars that teach us the scriptures, they don't even like people from up north. Those Galileans. Nazareth is in the region of Galilee. Those guys are hicks. They're uneducated. Messiah is not going to be uneducated. How can Messiah come from Nazareth? And then you know what else Peter, uh, Philip said? The son of Joseph. What? A carpenter's son? 
Okay, so he doesn't smell like fish. But he's a carpenter's son. He's not the son of a rabbi. He's not the son of a priest or a Pharisee. How could anybody fool Philip with that kind of credentials? I, I mean, Philip's not as bright as me, but he's not stupid. Well, Philip is not going to argue with him. If you can't argue with your friend, what do you say? Come and look for yourself. And that's what Philip says. Come and see. He doesn't have to argue with Nathaniel because he's not going to win. So Nathaniel's going to go. He's got this chip on his shoulder. He knows a con artist. And he's going to prove it to Philip. All right? Verses 47 through 49. When Jesus saw Nathanael approach, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Jesus is actually calling Nathanael a very spiritual person. Here comes a holy man. This guy is in tune with God. And what does Nathanael answer? Yeah, that's me. How'd you know? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's not like, yeah, that's me. No, he's saying, what makes you say that? How do you know? You, don't, you never met me. What makes you think I'm spiritual? Maybe that's how he conned Philip. You know, just butter him up, make him feel good, and then, yeah, I know all about you, Philip, because I'm the Messiah. Uh, Nathaniel's coming with caution. So how do you know me? Nathaniel asked Jesus. Uh, Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Have any questions? Rabbi is teacher. Oh, yeah. Okay. In other words, I trust you to teach me the scriptures. In fact, a rabbi is somebody who you want to become just like. I want to talk like you, teach like you, act like you. I want to do, I want to be a, a clone of you. Okay. So, a rabbi picks his disciples. I think you might qualify. Someday I can see you acting like me. Okay? And of course, out of all these people, everybody's saying, I want, to I want to be your follower. I want to be your disciple. But I'm picking one or two out of you. I'm going to go to another area and pick somebody else. But these are the people that will replace me when I'm gone. Okay? So, this is a very high status. You're going to be a rabbi. Okay, now, what questions come to your mind? What was he doing? Ah, what was who doing? Nathaniel. Yeah, what was he doing? When? You mean under the fig tree? Yeah. What was he doing under the fig tree? Think about this. If Jesus went to you and said, I saw you under a fig tree. Oh, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that would not convince me. Realize Nathaniel is very skeptical. He's going to try to catch a con artist. And now he's saying, oh, you are the Messiah. The question you should be asking is, what was he doing under that fig tree? Because before Philip called you, I saw you under a fig tree. Was 
we have like a the big tree have like a like a like a meaning or something? Do we can we scripture in it or Well it does later on, but we don't see any application here, right? A whole man? A holy man. Oh, holy man. Yes, praying. Now, I want you to use a cross reference, Matthew 6 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what you, what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay. Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount because there are a lot of Pharisees who are showing off. The way the Jews pray is they stand on a street corner during rush hour. They don't bow their heads and close their eyes. Jews lift up their hands to receive a blessing. They look to heaven with their eyes open and they speak out loud to their Lord. But these Pharisees are shouting out loud so everybody can look and see, oh, there's a holy man standing on a street corner during rush hour so everybody can see how holy he is praying to God. And Jesus tells them, no, if you want to really communicate with God, nobody should know that you're talking to me. Find some quiet place. Get alone with God. And then God who sees you in secret will reward you. He's going to hear your prayers. Philip had to find Nathaniel. Not even Philip knew where Nathaniel was. They don't live in the area. But Nathaniel went to be alone with the Lord. And sometimes when you're praying, you know, a lot of times when I'm praying, I feel like oh, my prayers just bounce off the ceiling. I don't think he heard me. Yes. To find a quiet spot where you can be alone. Philip, uh, Nathaniel is isolating himself, but when, he's, when he prayed this time, he was really making contact with God, like the heavens opened up. And at this time, Philip interrupts him and says, hey, we found the Messiah. Oh, good timing, Philip. You know, the, <laughs> I'm really enjoying my time with the Lord, and somebody, somebody deceived you. You think a carpenter's son from Nazareth is God. <laughs> Let me straighten you out, son. <laughs> so, I am on a mountaintop experience with God, and Philip says, come and see. I think I can tell a con artist because I'm really connected with God right now. And if this guy is a deceiver, the Lord's going to reveal him. Maybe that's why the Lord gave me this mountaintop experience to protect my friend Philip. And Jesus says, before Philip calls you, I was with you. He says, I saw you. Now it doesn't mean I looked at you. Use this just like you would it in English or in Spanish. I'll see you later. That means I'll meet with you, right? It doesn't mean I'm going to look at you, you know? See, because if I, I say, see you later, we're going to meet later. If I say, I want to look at you, I think your husband would start to get upset. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, I saw you, Phil, uh, Nathaniel, when you were under that fig tree. Only God saw me under the fig tree. When Jesus said, I saw you, we were connecting. Would you believe? If I were Nathaniel, oh, 
No wonder you call me an Israelite in whom there is no guile. I ask the question, how do you know? You answer me because we're connecting under the fig tree. Whoa, you are the Messiah. No one could give me that answer. Only God. Only God knows that. So like I said, when we're reading this chapter, there should be a lot of questions. And after I show you these questions, you're going to say, why didn't I see that question? I should have asked that question to myself before. This is one thing I like about reading John. A lot of things in the chapter causes me to ask questions. You'll get good at it. The more you practice inductive reading, the more you'll start asking questions. It doesn't mean you're going to get an answer. So if you have a question and uh, you have reference books at home that don't give you the answer, you make sure you pa ask Pastor Allen. Don't come to me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so. John 50 and 51. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than that. He, added, he, he then added, Verily, verily, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, if Nathaniel had been at the baptism of Jesus, do you think he would have doubts? If he saw the baptism of Jesus, he would have seen the Holy Spirit land on him, the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Nathaniel wouldn't have any questions. So I, I can tell he wasn't there. But Jesus prophesies at this point and he says, you're going to be there at my ascension. Uh, I get to see him go to heaven. Wow, what a blessing. Because you believe with this much information, I'm going to make sure you're there when I go to heaven. Wow, what a blessing. This is exciting. If we trust God, he blesses us tenfold. Now, I want you to imagine yourself on the walk to Galilee. Five guys and Jesus walking to Galilee. You know, it would be very interesting to hear Nathaniel's conversation with Jesus. I wasn't with Nathaniel under that tree. Only Jesus and Nathaniel spoke to each other under that tree. Just for fun, Nathaniel might say, Do you remember, Lord, what I asked you? And Jesus would say, Yes, Nathaniel, you asked me this, and this is how I answered you. And Nathaniel, says, Yeah, 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 that's it, that's it. Listen, guys, that's what he said. I, I asked him that, he answered that. Yep. He's the guy. How would you feel listening to their conversation? Wow, this is awesome. If I have any doubts, they're gone. They are absolutely gone. Imagine. A few days on the road with Jesus, then throwing your blanket out on, uh, on the ground, ready for a nap, it'd be like a little girl's slumber party. No slumber. Just a lot of excitement and a lot of talking all night long. Right? Can you, can you feel the excitement? I love this chapter. So, Anyway, this is how they, they walked all the way to Galilee. And once they get home, what would you do after this hike? I would tell my friends, I would tell my family, man, you should have been there. We did this the first night, then the second night, and... and, and they're going to look at me and say, you talk too much. You know, I, I would just be too excited. 
And you know what? I would probably dream about, boy, I wish we could do this again. Oh, I just wish we could do it forever. Six months later, there's another pilgrimage going to Jerusalem. And Jesus comes up to my fishing boat and says, follow me. Oh, I get to do it again. This time, the rabbi has called me. As I explained to you what a rabbi was, I have been chosen to become like the rabbi. I will stay with him and study him and learn what it must be to be like Jesus. And when Jesus is gone, people will sit under my teaching, and it will be like being under the teaching of Jesus. So, I'm glad you asked that question. What is a rabbi? Because the rabbi calls them around six months later. Notice how often John jumps out of chronological order to help you understand he is God. My point is to tell you that Jesus is God. So as long as you realize that we are not following chronological order, you can get much more out of this because you're finding out why he's writing this. And occasionally you'll have to say, if I were living in the eighth decade, how would I understand this? Because we want to read it the way the people it was written to understand this. Okay? And he wrote it in the 80s in Ephesus. Yes? What was happening around that time? Was Rome still like uh, in power? Or were yes. They, were they huge, Titus were they was huge? the emperor of Rome. Oh, wait. In the 80s? Yeah, Titus was the emperor of Rome in the 80s. But, uh, uh, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that the church started off Jewish, but the price for being a Christian is your family will disown you. They will hold a funeral for you. You are dead to the family. Get out of here. Okay? Your friends and, and all our neighbors are invited to this funeral. Okay? Everybody recognizes you. You are dead. Now, you're Jew. You, you, you can't come to synagogue anymore. You're dead. Get out of here. You cannot go to temple. You're dead. You come to the meat market. I pretend like you didn't come to the meat market. You're dead. I don't see a ghost. How are you going to buy kosher foods? Only if you have friends that will bring it to you on the black market. Pretty soon you're going to have to eat things that are not kosher. What friends do, what, who's going to be your friends? People who are not Jewish. Pretty soon all your friends are Gentiles. And you find out, well, they're not as bad as we used to talk about them, you know? They're nice people. In fact, they're a lot nicer than Jewish people now. Okay, so the church gradually became Gentile. And the book of Acts shows you the transition from a Jewish uh, congregation into a Gentile congregation. And the Apostle Paul was going to all these different Gentile congregations, teaching them. Okay? So, anyway. Yes. 49? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. <coughs> he recognizes Jesus as Messiah. At that time, it was not understood as to how does he do both? Is it all at the one time? Is he going to save us and uh, free us from Roman, uh, uh, the Roman Empire? Uh, he doesn't know. He doesn't have everything figured out. But he knows 
He is the Son of God. So he's saying he is Messiah. And he recognizes, you are my king. What you do as king, I have no idea. I don't know what your agenda is. But you are my king. Okay? The Pharisees will say he can't be that king. Because if he is a king, he has to do this. But he doesn't have to do that now. In fact, he's not going to do it now. He's going to come and save us now. He will return and do that later. So the details, the Pharisees are saying, we worked it out. We know what his agenda is. And uh, Nathaniel is not saying he no understands how. He just knows who. Okay? Oh, and... Uh, when, when uh, Paul and Peter went to Rome, they were under Emperor Nero, and he crucified Peter, and he cut off Paul's head. Okay? This was written after that. The temple was destroyed in 70. Uh, Peter and Paul were killed in the 60s. In 70, the temple was totally destroyed. This is written after the, the loss of the temple. The Jews are scattered. Okay? Not totally scattered. That'll happen in 123 AD. But right now, they are scattered. People have fled from Israel. John is writing from Ephesus, western Turkey today. And these are people who have rejected Jesus but they have memories of when he walked, what he taught, and they have secondhand information about who Jesus is and a lot of information from the Pharisees. And John is trying to straighten that out by saying, this is our Messiah. Let me prove it to you. Okay. So let's close in prayer because I've gone five minutes over. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to get excited about this relationship that you want because you want us to have a relationship just like we were hiking with you to be so close, to get excited to have you as a dear friend. Oh, Lord, we are so unworthy to even walk with you but you have invited us. And not only do you want this intimate relationship with us, you want us to be like you so that others will see you through the lives we live. And we pray, Lord, that we will grow in maturity as we learn to understand your word and love you more because we understand. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you.